In chapter 4 of The Way of Abiding, Long Chimpa talks about the theme of oneness. So oneness here, we're talking about the non-dual or one taste. We're not talking about the things that the, the Hindu Avedanta talks about when they talk about oneness. That's a whole different ballgame. In Buddhism, the one is my consciousness is the same as your consciousness, but it's my consciousness, if I can abuse the my part of that. <laughs> but it's, it's, we all have one consciousness, but it's not a single consciousness that we're all a part of the way it is in Hinduism. Okay? There's no grand consciousness uh, that uh, encompasses everything, if you will. So it's individualized. It's common to each of us, but it's still each individual's consciousness, if you will. So he begins by saying, all phenomena are shown to be one in naturally occurring timeless awareness. And the key point is to reveal all phenomena are first shown to have the same source. And so here he talks about awareness or oneness. So he's making the uh, equation of oneness and awareness being the same here. Okay. Awareness, oneness, is the ground of all phenomena. Although there is the appearance of multiplicity, to say that there is no wavering from oneness is to say that naturally occurring timeless awareness is the single source. Now, it's helpful to always keep in mind when you're looking at these sources, particularly in Dzogchen, that when we talk about mind, when we talk about these things, we're talking about it in the context of mind. Okay? We're not talking about it in the context of the physical world, if you will. So in the context of mind, what is the source of all of our experience? Awareness. If you don't have awareness, you have no experience at all. Zip. Zero. Okay? So awareness is the source. It is the ground of all the experiences that we have. And so then, I'm moving on to the uh, next page, the very top there, he says, there are different manifestations, although they are the display or the arising mode of a single awareness, in their essence they neither separate nor waver from it. Okay, so they have one taste. They're still both mind. Okay? From the all-creating monarch, he says, all phenomena are identical in their source, awakened mind. Okay, so he's using, adding another phrase here. And then down below the quote there, everything is shown to be one basic space, naturally occurring, timeless awareness. So when he's using that expression, one basic space, again, he's using that as being the same as naturally occurring, timeless awareness, or just awareness. Okay. Then the last four lines of the root text right below that, uh, since everything is of one basic space, primordially pure, there is no abiding as two. For all is encompassed within the single sphere. All experience happens within awareness. So Dharmakaya is without edges or corners. How marvelous. So he's got the single sphere, he's got one basic space, and then he's talking about emptiness here. So all of these things he's talking about, they have nuances of difference of meaning. They're all essentially referring to the same thing here. On the next page, uh, down uh, just before the, the root text, the simultaneity of purity, which refers to pure awareness, and equalness, or one taste, is shown to be naturally occurring timeless awareness. Then moving along onto page 208 here, toward the bottom of the page, in the citation from Reverberation of Sound. Moreover, Owing to their circumstances, among ordinary beings, there is not a single one who is not a Buddha. 
because their nature is in harmony with the naturally occurring timeless awareness. Okay, so when we talk in particularly Dzogchen and to some extent in Tantra, as every being, being a Buddha as opposed to having a seed that then becomes a Buddha, we're talking about it in this context of a Buddha being timeless awareness. Okay? This awareness itself is being a Buddha. So every sentient being then, from that perspective, already is a Buddha. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that as I look out and I see Joe over here, that Joe is in every way what Shakyamuni Buddha was. Okay? Joe's got a few obscurations, and those obscurations are clouding the fact that he is a Buddha. Right? So in order for him to become the equivalent of a Shakyamuni Buddha, he needs to deal with those obscurations and then he becomes the equivalent of Shakyamuni Buddha. Okay? So sometimes these things can get a little confusing if we're not careful on the use of language here. In the middle of the next page, 209, the essence of awareness, original purity, that is the ultimate basic space of supreme emptiness, is the very essence of Dharmakaya free of elaboration. So it's beyond words, beyond anything we can describe. This is spoken of as the sacred palace of naturally occurring timeless awareness, the heart essence of enlightenment. So this pure awareness is the very essence of what enlightenment is all about. Now there's some other aspects as we've talked about in other classes and in this class related to what that is, but that's the essence of it. Okay? It does have manifestations that arise from that and so forth that uh, relate to our behavior, respect to others, with respect to how we're able to uh, see other things, experience those things, as well as then how we respond to those things, particularly things that we have referred to previously as afflictive emotions. So when those afflictive emotions arise, how we respond is critical. Just the fact that we have Buddha nature doesn't mean that we're going to respond to it the way Shakyamuni Buddha would. Okay? So we have to do practice. We have to do our meditation practice and so forth to get to the point where we have such a strong sense of that awareness that nothing can penetrate it. Nothing can cause you to fall off or respond in a negative way of some kind to whatever that experience is that we're having. And then continuing on down below that quote that followed that last section here, this is the basic space, the source, from which samsara, nirvana, and the three kayas arise. So everything arises from this awareness, pure awareness or rigpa. Continuing on the next page, 210, down the last section here from the Vajra Fortress by Garib Dorje. Within Dharmakaya, unchanging, non-existent as an object and extending indefinitely the arising of the animate and inanimate universe is Sambhokakaya. While apparent phenomena manifesting like reflections are Nirmanakaya. Okay? Now he's using those words in a slightly different way and sometimes in Dzogchen we begin to see that application of those words to concepts that initially were not intended, let's say. Okay? Kaya means body. Okay? Here we're talking about the animate and inanimate universe. Okay? The animate part would have bodies but the inanimate part would not. Okay, so when we apply that to my mug here, okay, we don't think of that as having a Buddha body, all right? And so in that sense, he's using the word a little bit differently than what we normally would. But we see that sometimes in Dzogchen, in the application in a some, somewhat broader context than we normally would when talking about Buddhahood, where you have the uh, physical body of a Buddha and the Sambhokakaya body of a Buddha and the Dharmakaya body of a Buddha. 
He's applying it to other kinds of things here. And then on the next page, the source, again, awareness, is shown to be oneness. From the root text, the unique vast expanse is not created by anyone. All things that emerge from it, all possible phenomena without exception, are one within the fundamental ground from which they emerge since causality is negated. Suchness itself, empty yet lucid, is the supremely spacious nature of phenomena, evident as pure space without extremes or biases. So the phenomena that we're talking about here are our experiences. Okay? And so through our Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Nimanakaya, we have these experiences, and even though they're virtually identical to any ordinary being's experiences, our perception of them, our worldview of them, has changed. The key in Dzogchen is the view. You have to understand the view, basically Dharmakaya, or Buddha nature. If you understand the view, the meditation is the view. If you understand and do the meditation, which is what uh, makes that secure in terms of how you respond to things, then the fruition is also the view. They're all just the view. Okay. Moving on then, the next page to 12, the uh, just below the quote section at the top, awareness, oneness, is shown to be the basic space of phenomena. So we have awareness is equal to oneness is equal to basic space. Again, all meaning the same thing. So then down below uh, the, the first line there, then awareness is the source. It abides like space beyond deliberate effort. So there's nothing that we have to do. Awareness happens. We're all aware. The question is, do we know that we're aware? That knowing, the luminous emptiness, is what's important here. Moving on to the next page, the section toward the bottom there. The essence of awareness is beyond imagination and expression. So that's the ineffable part. You try to explain it, you try to understand it in a concrete way, and that's no longer it. Now it may be helpful to describe it in some ways, which of course he's doing here, uh, but we have to be very careful about reifying that, to make that what it is. I and mean, that would create the problem. And then moving along to page 214, toward the bottom of the last section of that page. Although all things manifest within a single awareness, they do not waver from that oneness. It all comes from that single source. And so that's the oneness. So they manifest in lots of different ways. Over here I have a cup, over there I have a bell, over somewhere else I have a book, and so forth. So they all have their unique qualities and characteristics, but they all come from awareness. I experience them through awareness. And that's the oneness. So he says in the second line in the root text, there is no duality. And then at the bottom, it's phenomena just as it is. The top of the next page, within the scope of completely ineffable essence of a single awareness, the world of appearances and possibilities, samsara and nirvana, arise in inconceivable and countless ways, but in arising it does not go beyond the non-dual scope. Okay. So it arises and manifests in many different ways, but it's just the manifestation of our awareness. So that's the oneness. It has that single quality that everything has. And then going down <clears throat> to the next section on the same page, 215 there, kind of concludes by saying at the top of the root text section, everything is connected in oneness. This is the supreme quality 
of awakened mind. So that is the most important part of that section. Moving on to page 216 then. Thus, all phenomena are of the single taste within oneness, which is awareness. And then he quotes from the Tantra of naturally occurring perfection, Dharmakaya, the scope of emptiness, naturally occurring timeless awareness, non-conceptual basic space is the heart essence of awareness, empty yet lucid, ineffable, spontaneously present, great perfection. Okay, so he's using some other terminology to try and give you a better sense of what that is, but in essence it's beyond our ability to express as words. So we just have to be careful in trying to understand it as words. And then, and the direct encounter with the three Kaya states, the basic space is precious, wish-fulfilling gem, since everything occurs naturally without effort. Awareness is the splendor that fulfills all wishes. Awakened mind is the all-inclusive source. Awakened mind is non-dual. Basic space is evenness, is no self or other. And then discerning the implications, the next section. And there he talks about the implication being that consciousness and apparent phenomena in themselves constitute this naturally occurring awareness. So all apparent objects are unreal appearances. And again here when we talk about real and unreal, he's talking about real in the sense of whether or not it is empty of inherent existence or has inherent existence. So unreal would mean that it lacks inherent existence. Okay, so all apparent objects are unreal appearances. They lack inherent existence. The realm of emptiness. Regardless of how things appear, rest within that is singularly uncontrived. So we just rest. We've talked about this over and over again. You just rest in that state and let it happen naturally. Rest in naturally unsullied awareness, he says. So there's a sense of relaxation. And then from the, on the next page from the all-creating monarch, the last line of that section, one meditates by resting in the natural state without seeking. Okay? You just rest. Let it happen as it is. And then uh, just down below that a bit, another implication is that the simultaneous arising and freeing of thoughts constitutes awareness. Okay. The arising and freeing of thoughts constitutes awareness. Thoughts come and they go by themselves. And we're not disturbed by those. So he just says, rest gently in utter relaxation. And then toward the very bottom of the page, he describes it as being like waves on water. Freedom comes about in non-duality of mental states but of abiding and stirring. So like waves come and waves go. Thoughts come and thoughts go. And so it's the non-stirring of those. It's when the stirring happens that we begin to get attached to things and so forth. On page 218, from the all-creating monarch again, starting with the second line, there is no duality of meditation and something upon which to meditate. Now, the non-duality, one taste, and so forth sometimes refer to different things. But in this case, it's referring to uh, the object and the, the subject. So one meditates by resting naturally without deliberately meditating. Ultimate reality, the meaning of under, underlying everything, is unborn. Okay, so this is when we in Dzogchen talk about non-meditation. This is what we're talking about. There's not a specific do this, do that. There's not specific phrases to be chanted. There's not anything that we have to do but just rest in that state. But it's not the same as basic shamatha. Okay? It's easy to get confused with that because it looks very similar. But it's 
like a shamatha without signs as opposed to basic shamatha which is with signs. So you have an object of focus. In this there's no object of focus. You just rest in that state and let it be. Okay? But there's a knowing, there's a luminosity that goes along with that. And that really is the key difference, that you know because you're awake. There's a knowing and, and we stay in touch with that at all times. We don't let that ever go away. At least ideally. <laughs> okay, another implication here at the bottom of the page is that mental states of abiding and stirring do not constitute a duality. Abiding and stirring do not constitute a duality. It's kind of like what he was saying in the section before. It's just one taste. So here from the root text he says, the, uh, in the natural context of evenness with no split between objects and mind, rest free of any framework. He's kind of reiterating that. And then on the top of the next page from the perfect dynamic energy of the lion, in the, the fourth line there, non-conceptual and supreme dharmakaya is discovered inwardly. So it's not something that we find outside. It's like there's a metaphor that talks about looking for an elephant by following the tracks, but the elephant is actually inside your house. Okay? You're going outside trying to find it. It is not there. It's inside. Same thing here. This is all inside. It's not something you find out there somewhere. And then going on to page 220, that paragraph in the middle. There is evenness with no duality of objects and mind. One discovers enlightened intent in which nothing is discarded or adopted. There is evenness whether or not thoughts occur. One rests imperturbably in awareness and so one discovers enlightened intent that neither comes nor goes. So once we discover this it stays, it becomes permanent, if you will. And there we get into a little philosophical debate. <laughs> but, but that's the idea, is it does not go. It stays there. Once you attain this and you, you uh, develop a sense of uh, uh, the strength of this through doing the practice, okay, then you always have it. It's always there no matter what is going on. And it is through that that afflictive emotions no longer are able to disturb what we do. Okay? And then at the bottom of the page from the All Creating Monarch, he says, all in supreme bliss, just as it is, effortless, do not make any effort with body, speech, or mind. Do not contrive reality or create constructs. Do not conceptualize. Do not be influenced by ordinary distinctions. Rest in the ultimate experience of bliss, naturally occurring timeless awareness. So here the idea of bliss is a little bit different than we talk about in Tantra. Do not adopt postures, suppress the senses, or restrict speech, for nothing need be undertaken mind will rest without wavering wherever it goes. So it doesn't matter what's going on in your life, what kind of experiences you're having, you rest in the state of stability. Okay? You're not bouncing all over the place with emotions and, and all kinds of other things in your experiences, but there's a, a stability that uh, is there, is present, the sense of peace. The Buddha sometimes used the word peace as a way of describing this. Going on then to page 222, the, toward the bottom, the quote section there, from the spoken words, the secret oral lineage, Sri Singha said, awakened mind is like empty space. The highest meditation has nothing to do with concepts or focused attention. One's own nature is unwavering and uncontrived. The mind of a holy person abides thus in suchness. It just is. Okay. And then in this context there arises meditative stability. 
going on to 2.23 in the bottom section just below the, the root text that's in the middle of the page. With awakening to unobstructed awareness, naked in its timeless freedom, one reaches Dharmakaya, enlightened intent in which phenomena are resolved. Okay, so phenomena no longer bother us. They still come and go, but they no longer bother us. In a state of peace. Going on to the next section on page 226. Embracing the larger scope. Everything is of one basic space, subsumed within naturally occurring timeless awareness. So everything that we experience happens within awareness. All phenomena are embraced, embraced within a single self-knowing awareness. And then skipping on down uh, to the next little section here. Regardless of how things appear, they are embraced within awareness. No awareness, no things. Okay. And then skipping the root text piece. However things appear moment by moment, they appear in light of awareness and so are subsumed within, are in light of awareness. So we only experience things through awareness. So top of the next page in the final analysis, they are embraced within a single awareness. Is the second line, they, there are nothing, they are nothing other than awakened mind. Experientially. They are nothing but our awakened mind. And then moving on down just below the middle of the page, the meaning of this section is summarized by the fact that everything is embraced within naturally occurring timeless awareness. Now it can only be embraced within timeless awareness if we are paying attention to the fact and knowing that that's what's going on. If we're just seeing things, hearing things, and so forth. That's not it. Okay? You have to pay attention to the fact that that's what you're doing at the same time. And then uh, from the heart, or excuse me, <laughs> heart essence, starting to read here, from the middle of the root text, the ultimate heart essence without transition or change is embraced within the very heart of enlightenment, unwavering awareness. And then his commentary, since the entire world of appearances, whether samsara or nirvana, is, is encompassed within awareness, samatabhadra, the nature of phenomena, phenomena are none other than that awareness, awakened mind. So again, he's piling a bunch of phrases that we use to try and uh, describe this or, or attach to it when we're trying to talk about it. Uh, but again, you have to be careful about reifying those terms, those words, as if they are it. Moving on to 228, coming to the decisive experience. Now in coming to the decisive experience of everything as naturally occurring timeless awareness, one comes to a decisive experience of the ultimate heart essence without beginning or end. So within oneness, the decisive experience is that of naturally occurring timeless awareness itself, basic space without beginning or end. Beginning and end are just concepts, right? So we have to let go of the idea of a beginning or an end and just abide in what is. So then he goes on, for example, from the all-creating monarch, top of the next page, and he says, compassion, and then skipping a few lines, abides timelessly. Okay. It's constantly there. And then toward the bottom of the page, the last section here, one comes to the decisive experience of awareness beyond characterization or description. And we've been referring to that, that you can't say what it is. And then the last line there says, enlightened intent surpasses ordinary mind. That's part of what I've been alluding to here. You have to get beyond ordinary mind of just seeing and hearing to recognize that you are 
hearing and seeing and so forth. And you're doing that because you are aware. So there's a, this knowing aspect of it. On the top of page 230, there is nothing to be known through language or expressed in words. The first section that he talked about was the ineffability section. So he's bringing that back in again here. And then in the middle of the next page, in summary, one comes to the decisive experience of the resolution of phenomena as a supreme and unnameable state. So you come to realize that when we talk about mind, the mind of enlightenment in particular, it's beyond anything that we can really say about it. Okay? But it's the supreme state. There's nothing higher that you can come to when it comes to mind. Okay? Awareness is really the heart essence of what it's all about. But we have some control over that. We have a choice in how we respond to the things that we become aware of. And so that is the other part that's important. It's not just the awareness. Awareness just by itself isn't enough. You need both wings of the bird to fly. Compassion and the, the wisdom aspect. Okay. Moving to 234 then. Everything is of one basic space, timeless awareness. All phenomena without exception are of one taste in total purity, and so non-duality as the meaning of the definitive conclusion concerning oneness has been explained. So this is the commentary on the fourth Vajra topic, reaching the definitive conclusion concerning the oneness of all phenomena within awareness, timeless awareness as their source. So the oneness that we're talking about here is within the context of awareness. Okay. So it's always important to keep that context in mind because other traditions have other ways of using those words and if we confuse the two then we're going to confuse what is really being said here. 